If you're on the ASMR side of YouTube, you've more than likely seen a mysterious female that wears a mask over her eyes while dining on large portions of meat, particularly raw meat. I love her work and I've been obsessed with her since day one. The way she made ASMR eating sounds really captivated my attention. For the purpose of this story, I'll refer to her as Kathy. There's something alluring about the way she wears a mask in every single video, only revealing her mouth down to her hands. I revel in the fact that she stays so thin and fit while putting away enough raw meat to feed an army in every video. I can't help but simp over her. I'll admit, I've grown a little bit of an obsession. The way her fingers bathe in the sauce when she dips the meat, and the way the dressing dribbles out the sides of her mouth, it's just mesmerizing. I've never missed a live stream, let alone an upload. I presume most will refer to me as a fanboy due to my excessive promotion of Kathy on social media. I would like to think that she is where she is success-wise thanks to my devotion. I know a thing or two about marketing and advertising, so spreading the word on her channel had come second nature to me. I noticed her channel had been elevating since I shared her content with my followers. I've watched her subscribers escalate to nearly a million and couldn't be prouder. Her views have been ascending since I followed her. Coincidence? I don't think so. But as of late, speculations from her comment section have noticed her health declining. The latest live stream nearly threw me in a state of panic. Hurry up. You need to eat faster. I could see Kathy forcibly regurgitate her already devoured mouthful of food. To be honest, I felt like vomiting myself while watching, so I left the room to pull myself together. I could almost smell the distinct odor of raw salmon mixed with Kathy's stomach acid. But what people were more concerned about was the voice behind the screen that kept egging her on despite her choking. Nonetheless, the voice eventually went away and Kathy was just gorging in the same manner that we all love and appreciate. I was able to enjoy the rest of the stream, but the comments on the whispering never ceased. A few of them read, Who was that? Is she being forced to do this? Or, I don't think she really wants to eat that. My stomach dropped reading the dissatisfaction from her followers. My concern for the success of her channel got worse the next time Kathy went live. This time, there were really dark bruises on her arms and sores on her lips. To my dismay, as though the floodgates had been opened, commenters were coming out of nowhere and pointing out the bruises. I began typing in the chat box to chime in on the whole ordeal saying, Kathy, please cut the feed, darling. You don't look well. Get some help. She must have seen my plea as the feed was cut. I closed my laptop and headed down to my kitchen to hammer down a cold one. The intensity behind the comments section left me feeling parched and in need of a drink or two. Unfortunately, things didn't get better for Kathy, but would only get worse over time. The next live stream, she was chomping on meat as usual. However, one of her teeth crumbled and fell out of her mouth. Again, I couldn't help but feel grossed out, so I had to leave the room for a bit. Put it back in your mouth. As I returned back to the stream, I saw Kathy stuffing her fallen tooth into a raw steak. She lifted the meat to her mouth while trembling. At first glance, I didn't know if she was aware of her actions or not, but then I remember seeing her consciously stuff the tooth in the steak. Again, I couldn't help but feel sick to my stomach, so I stepped out of the room again to take another breather. A voice from behind the camera yelled, Hurry up! As Kathy winced from fear, as I came back to my room, I saw Kathy taking a bite. As she chewed, I could hear the crunching of her tooth breaking which caused more teeth to fall out along with a few streams of blood. Tears profusely ran from under her eye mask as she whimpered in agony. I left a comment begging her to stop the feed and get help. Again, the feed stopped after my comment. I was now convinced that Kathy knew who I was, despite us being separated virtually. Nonetheless, I was content with her ending yet another bizarre ASMR mukbang stream. The comments continued after the stream. One room. I'm glad they stopped the stream, but I can only imagine what's happening to her off camera. As if I hadn't seen enough, the next live stream sent me over the edge. Kathy was dipping raw salmon into that famous red sauce and began tapping the bowl in a particular pattern. The comment section started blowing up as most viewers recognized her tapping as Morse code. She was allegedly signaling the word help, which really pissed me off. 
I rushed down the stairs and where I've kept Kathy and said, You ungrateful wench! I starve you every week, so you work up a hell of an appetite, and I provide a massive meal for you! Not to mention I help you keep your figure! Now you have the nerve to ask for help using Morse code! I made you famous, and this is how you repay me! <laughs> 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 Since that day, I've kept the channel up because I don't want anyone being suspicious of me. To all her fans, don't worry, I've been checking up on her, but no one's ever going to see her again. I hear now there's a cluster of theories that Kathy was being held against her will. Whether you believe that or not, no one will ever know what truly happened to her. Sincerely, Anonymous. On October 22nd, 2012, a woman in her early 20s named Whitney suddenly vanished on her way to work at Starbucks. What concluded within the case shocked the entire nation and unfortunately ended in a brutal fatality. The next animation was inspired by this tragic event. There was a time not so long ago that my only relationship to Starbucks was that I worked there. I wasn't a fanatical customer. I wasn't the owner of a franchise. All I had to do with the coffee chain was the fact that I could be seen in the drive through window in the dark hours of the late shift. For a long time, I thought this meant literally nothing. After all, very little business ever came through the drive through at the hour, especially given the location I worked at, being somewhere most people consider as the middle of nowhere. Most people were just stopping by to get some caffeine so they could continue with their overnight drives across the middle of the country. The inside was closed anyway, but I doubt most of them would have considered staying for long if it was. It wasn't an urban craft coffee house, it was just a rural Starbucks. Hi, welcome to Starbucks. How may I take your order? Um, yeah, so, like... I'd like a grande iced caramel macchiato with extra vanilla sweet foam, two pumps of caramel syrup, two pumps of mocha syrup with soy milk and brown sugar topping. Oh, and uh, two extra shots of espresso. I never understood how people could put such diabetic abominations into their bodies and continue to function normally. And it always amused me how they seemed allergic to real cow's milk, as if it was unhealthy or something, when they were about to consume enough sugar to put a toddler into a coma. But that's beside the point, because for all the silly sorority girls and giggling frat boys coming in to order this unholy concoction, or another, none of them caused anybody any harm, except maybe to their own pancreas. Actually, as a matter of fact, when I look back on those people now, I tend to see them as fond memories of a simpler, more innocent time in my life. More than anything, I wish I could go back to my old life of standing in that drive through and feeding people's addictions to caffeine and sugar. Unfortunately, there's just no way that's going to be possible. Not after what happened that night. The night began no different than any other. There was nothing in the air that suggested any of the things that were about to happen. So, when the beat-up old truck rolled into the empty drive through without a license plate, I didn't bat an eye. The drive through had a couple cameras pointed toward the intercom, so we could easily remember which cars were supposed to be getting what drinks. But it wasn't meant for identifying license plates and tipping off the police about people with expired tags or whatever. For the most part, the truck looked like a textbook local, some kind of farmhand or factory worker getting roped into some late night work and stopping in for some coffee. The man inside of it, however, was somehow even worse for wear. Hi, welcome to Starbucks. How may I take your order? Hmm, your voice sounds just perfect. What do you look like? Heh, <laughs> yeah. You'll find out when you come around to pick up your order. What would you like to drink? You guys do all those fancy coffees, right? I guess I'll get a large hot latte with two globs of Starbucks saliva, two locks of barista hair, and uh... Sir, this isn't funny. You'll have to order something on the menu, please. Oh, I'm not trying to be funny, sweetheart. I'm serious. I'll give you the biggest tip of your life if you splash some of your very own urine in my drink. <laughs> I'm not putting up with this. 
Would you rather speak to my manager, sir? No, no, no. I want you to serve me. And I'd really love it if you'd serve me some of your blood with that coffee. If you don't mind. Okay, that's enough. If you don't get the hell out of here, I'm calling the cops. I dealt with some seriously rude and disrespectful customers before, but this guy certainly took the cake. I watched him drive off from the intercom, hoping that he would just be some creepy old dude playing some kind of crass joke on a college student, and that he would drive off and not stop at the window. But of course, he wasn't ready to leave yet. He screeched to a stop just outside the window, leaning out of his car door with a strangely apologetic face, pleading something with his hands together. Reluctantly, I opened the window just a crack. I'm sorry, really. I didn't mean to freak you out. You're just as perfect as you sounded. You know, you have the most beautiful blonde hair. Such long, sultry hair. Anyway, I'm sorry about all that back there. I, I just want a black coffee. I wasn't sure what to make of the situation. He seemed like he was just some out-of-touch old creep trying to prey on some younger women, which obviously is a terrible thing to do, but I wasn't worried about men like that. I worked at a rural Starbucks, and that was something I'd had to handle a lot of. I could handle myself around creeps like him. It wasn't worth getting reprimanded to deny him service. And how will you be paying? He held out a clenched fist while he stared at me with hungry, wrinkled eyes, almost drooling over his sagging chin. I ignored his gaze and opened the window a little more to get my arm through. I held out my hand to receive the change, but when he opened his fist, there was nothing in it at all. In the same instant, he latched onto my arm with a vice grip and yanked onto my arm. He was so much stronger than I thought he could be. He pulled me right out through the window and into his car, right as I got the time to react, just beginning my struggle against him. He struck me over the head with something like a hammer, and I blacked out. When I came to, I was bound to a table, my legs chained up to the ceiling, my clothes nowhere to be found. I realized that I was in that man's cellar when I saw him standing behind a camera on a tripod. I thought I knew what was about to happen but I had no idea. Do you know what the Starbucks mascot looks like? No, please just let me go. You, the mascot looks like you, you stupid girl. Here's something else I bet you didn't know. The mascot is a mermaid and I'm gonna make one out of you. No, please don't. <laughs> This story was inspired by a case regarding an army veteran who was in a coma for X amount of months. After being ill for quite some time, the man goes through a nightmarish journey in hopes of getting his life back. And of course, Taco Bell. Here's what it looked like. I'm a veteran with a wife and two kids, so staying fit has always been important to me. But after getting out of the service, like many veterans, I was faced with some post-traumatic stress. All in all, I think my case was less severe than most, and I was lucky to get home without any physical injuries. That said, I had to find a way to cope. For me, it was Taco Bell. That's not as bad as some of the other ways one can self-medicate, but my addiction to the fast food Tex-Mex did have some negative effects on my health. I started to gain weight, and to this, my wife caught on rather quickly. I love you, baby, but... You have to stop eating so much Taco Bell. You're gonna have a heart attack. Don't worry, babe, I'm going to be fine. Even though she turned out to be right, it was really hard for me to stop. I never really did. I don't know why I turned to Taco Bell exactly. Maybe it was because it was one of those things I missed while on deployment. One of those things that reminded me of home and kept me going through the hard times. My wife would always take it away if she saw me with it. So I started getting sneaky. I'd go out for errands and order a large quantity, eat some while I was out, then smuggle the rest inside and munch on it while nobody was looking, or while I was in the bathroom using the toilet or taking a shower. Any chance I could get. Really. Even in bed. Textbook addiction stuff, according to my therapist. 
But it all came to a head in a really strange way when I came down with double <gasps> pneumonia. At first, I just had a cough, but within a few days, I was bedridden. Even then, I was asking my wife to get me Taco Bell. My illness scared her so bad she took me to the hospital instead. There, I got hooked up to a bunch of wires and machines, and then I had a heart attack and fell into a coma. Some people say that when you're comatose, you're actually aware of everything that's going on around you. You just can't react to it or remember it when you wake up. I don't know about all that, but I can say that in my case, it wasn't just like falling asleep and waking up two months later. It was more like a pendulum swing of life and death. Like I'd be down, then I'd feel like I was about to come up for a moment, then I'd fall again. I was stuck in some kind of cycle of being totally knocked out, then almost regaining consciousness, then falling deeper into the coma. Unfortunately, though, it wasn't all counting sheep. Every time I slipped back, I was gripped with a horrible nightmare, and always the same one. In the beginning, I was running away from it, but it was always faster than me. Eventually, it got to me and took me down to the floor, but there wasn't really a floor just an abyss getting closer and closer to the flames of the underworld. There, it started gnawing on my legs viciously, with jagged, serrated teeth. It didn't want me to be able to get back up and start running again. The pain was unimaginable. And as the demon severed my legs, it kept pulling me closer to whatever kind of fiery portal it came from. I tried so hard to crawl away from it but I just kept sliding against my will, and it felt like I was being dragged against a bed of nails or a belt sander, like my skin was being torn away as I was taken. But every time I got close to the portal, what felt like the point of no return or the edge of death itself, it would all vanish into blackness, and I would think that I was finally about to come to. I would try to get up, to say something, or simply to get my own lungs breathing again. Sometimes, I swear I could even hear the voices of doctors, or see my wife sitting beside me, waiting for me. I'd try to grasp onto her so I wouldn't go back, but it was no use. After getting just a few seconds of somewhat benevolent reality, I'd snap back to my race towards death. It all started happening faster and faster, like my chances of survival were getting slimmer and slimmer. No matter how hard I screamed, there'd be nobody to hear me. No matter how hard I kicked at the face of the demon trying to eat me, there'd be only bloody, ravaged stumps left of my legs. And every time, it would get more of me. I was eventually reduced to a torso, with the shreds of my legs long gone down the gullet of the beast. I was so weak. I couldn't fight it anymore. There was no skin left on my arms from all the crawling, and my bones were beginning to wither away. I was almost a goner. It was taking me down closer to the raging inferno than ever before, and I got a good look down into it. There was an army of disembodied hands waiting there for me in the eternal fire, itching to tear my soul to shreds and make me one of them. I was just about to give up but the only thing that saved me was feeling the flames finally begin to lick the remnants of my body. The fierce heat of imminent immolation hit me like an electric shock. I fought back with more fury than ever before, not even physically, just all in my soul. You can't take me. You can try, but you can't. None of you can. Not bullets, not bombs, not sickness, not fire. Screw you. I am not finished yet. And then, just like that, without any warning whatsoever, it all vanished. I was in the blackness again, but this time it was different. I could feel it. It was dry. I soon realized that I was feeling the parchedness of my eyelids, mouth, and nose. I tried to speak, but there was something in my throat. My first attempts at movement were rather pitiful, and I could just tell that I had become terribly weak. I started to panic, and that set off a bunch of events around me that I couldn't quite perceive. People shouting and walking, but all I could see was the blackness getting lighter, turning gray. And then I felt the thing in my throat get yanked out. Somebody. A doctor. Pride opened my eyelids and flashed a light into my pupils. 
I got my first look at everything in a long time, and I started being able to decipher the words that were being said. Phew, I thought you were lost there for a minute. You sure are a trooper. Oh my god, oh my god, he's awake! Are you okay? There was so much going on, so many people around, I couldn't really focus on responding to any one person. Instead, I just looked inward and tried to communicate what it was my body needed most in that moment. The words came out slurred and jumbled, but I clearly remember managing the words. I... want... Taco... Bell. Unfortunately, because of how badly I deteriorated during the coma, I wasn't able to get my fix for a long time. I weighed in at a size I'd never been since middle school. I was hardly able to walk or talk, and I certainly wasn't ready for solid food. My stomach shrank to the size of a lemon or something. It was almost another two months before the day finally came, when my wife arrived with a big bag of those hot, spicy, crunchy, juicy tacos. I've never had that dream since, and I have a newfound love for all the things in my life, which is gradually helping me get off of my addiction to Taco Bell. I think of myself as hotter than the average girl, but I'm not vain. Other people are allowed to disagree that I'm hotter than them if they want to. Of course, they never do, because why would they? Most people who lay eyes on me tend to have trouble taking their eyes off me, so you really can't call me snobby for noticing the attention that I'm getting. It's not even exclusively men that seem drawn to me. Women give me eyes too, and not just glares of jealousy, though I get plenty of those as well. I guess some women just hate to see me flaunt what I've got. While some people feel gross when random creeps stare at them, I actually feel rejuvenated by some longing looks from strangers. There's an indoor pool facility attached to my local gym that I go to almost every day. Those glutes don't pump themselves, you know. But while I love exercising to maintain my sculpted body, my favorite part about going to the gym is getting in the hot tub and relaxing after a good workout. There are always tons of people in the pool area, and the hot tub is in a corner that can be seen from any spot in the facility, which means there's always eyes on me. Plus, I always change into a bikini after my workout. It's hard to describe just how euphoric the experience of dipping into that warm, bubbly water is for me. But recently, there's been a problem with my routine. There's a man that's been coming to the pool recently. An incredibly fat and ugly man, too. Because of him, I'm no longer as comfortable in my happy place as I once was. It's not that I necessarily needed to be alone in the tub to be comfortable. Don't misunderstand me. If there's a cute boy in the tub with me, that's just gravy for the both of us. And of course, I'm always respectful to the random strangers and senior citizens who come to the tub on occasion for therapeutic reasons. But with this man, it's different. Very different. His name is Willie, and he's here almost every day. At least he's here every day that I'm here. And because he seems to make no effort to shed any of the disgusting bags of fat wrapped around his body, he never goes to the gym which means he's almost always posted up in the tub long before I'm done with my workout and ready to relax. And because he's such a gigantic slob, there's barely any space in the hot tub for anyone else when he's in it. The tub is meant to comfortably fit six people at once, even up to eight normal-sized people. But Willie makes it look like a personal bathtub. Unfortunately, the only space left in the tub after he gets in is one little spot directly across from him. And even then, my knees are always butting up against his stomach. I bet he wishes he could be even fatter so that there would be no space at all left for anyone else. I'm still not phased by it though. I've dealt with my fair share of gross men, and I've long been done with freaking out and acting like a prima donna just because someone is covered in cellulite. I'm a grown woman, you know. I have a great deal of composure. Hey there, hot stuff. Can it, Willie? Well, guess you're not talking to me again. Girl, we spend so much time together, it just ain't right that I don't even know your name, don't you think? If I told you my name, that would imply that I enjoy your company. And I don't. I wish you would leave and stop hogging the damn tub every day. Suit yourself. I'm actually a pretty interesting guy if you ever decide to give me the time of day. But I'm not going anywhere. This is my tub as far as I'm concerned. Trust me, there is a lot I could say to Willie. But I try my hardest to bite my tongue whenever I can in order to say as little to him as possible. I don't want us to start having real conversations, even if they're completely negative. Otherwise, Willie might start to get the fantastic idea that he has a chance with me, but he'll never have that. Every day when I came in, I would see him cause tsunami-like waves from the cannonballs he formed at the pool. 
but then he would eventually hog the top, giving up any hope for others to enjoy it. I would just sit myself down in that one little corner he can't fill and enjoy myself in absolute spite of it. Every day he tries to talk to me, and every day I stonewall him and get what I want despite his best efforts otherwise. I think this has been a regular thing for about two months now. Things have gotten a little intense. I actually spend more time in the hot tub than I ever used to. It's a matter of principle. Willie sits in there the whole day without considering that other people want to enjoy it as well. So when I get in there with him, I feel like I can't leave until he leaves. Or I would be admitting to a supremacy over the hot tub. And I know that's ridiculous, but you should see the way he talks to people who dare to ask him to share. I'm doing this for all the patrons of the hot tub. I have to win. I have to knock that pig down a few pegs. But I do have to say, I never thought it would come to what it has. Last night, Willie just wouldn't shut up. He kept telling me to leave the hot tub. You should just give up, Miss Melons. You're not gonna win this war, so get used to seeing this six pack of flap every day. Better leave while you can, or else I'll unleash my secret weapon. I was deep in the trenches of utterly ignoring him. I had no idea he was serious. But after he lobbed that threat a few times, he really did it. All of a sudden, the water started getting warmer. Then I noticed a discolored yellowish cloud floating up from underneath Willie's stomach. And that's when I knew he was pissing in the tub. Yuck! What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Willie just laughed. I hate that laugh so much. <laughs> it was perhaps the most disgusting thing I ever did. And I only did it to spite him. But I stayed. Slowly the heat dissipated, but that's when the smell hit me. But when I thought that I'd have this victory by pinching my nose, Willie played his trump card, and it went from bad to worse. He leaned over for a second and farted, sending some bubbles rising to the top. But right behind the bubbles was something else. The yellow turned to a murky, frothy brown, followed by a few chunks of... Oh god, I hate remembering this part. A few chunks of turds. Willie was just chuckling. Soiling my happy place with his feces. <laughs> oh my god! I jumped out as quickly as I could, but it was all stuck to me. So I ran to the showers as Willie laughed behind me in victory. That's when I knew this had to end. I had an ingenious idea while I rinsed off Willie's secret weapon. The next morning, I arrived earlier than ever. I had to make sure I got there before Willie. I let him think he had won, deciding to take a dip in the pool and swim around instead of claiming the hot tub. When he arrived, he made straight for the hot tub. He stared at me as he sat down into it, looking smugger than he ever had before. He smiled and laughed out loud, spinning around in his winning way, creating a little whirlpool in the jet foam. <laughs> but his laughs didn't last long. Soon, he started to get agitated for an apparently unknown reason. He started scratching all over his arms and legs like he just jumped into a pile of poison ivy. Pretty soon, his skin started turning all red, forming boils and blisters everywhere. But because I didn't take my eyes off him, he didn't dare leave the tub, because that would mean defeat after all he had done to win. Then, he started to bleed. The blood came from his eyes, his nose, his mouth, and especially from all the freshly opened wounds now covering his body. I think at some point he did try to crawl out, but by then the water was a dark, turbid red. I think his legs were probably reduced to bone by then. Once the water got over his head, it was over. He gurgled and thrashed quite a bit, but all ineffectually. <laughs> but because I didn't take my eyes off him, he didn't dare leave the tub, because that would mean defeat after all he had done to win. I certainly enjoyed watching it all go down. And all I had to do was get in the facility before it opened and pour in the right combination of acids and catalytic enzymes while nobody was looking. See, I might look like a dim-witted floozy with a rockin' body, but in reality, I'm a force to be reckoned with, with a rockin' body. The next story was inspired by the disturbing case of an Arkansas woman who will call Stacy for the sake of the story. The details revolving this particular case are so disturbing that the general public had a hard time coping with the events that went down. Here's what it looked like. You find the strangest things on the internet. Even though some trends are more on the strange side, we're all suckers to them in one way or the other. A few years ago, the ASMR trend infiltrated the internet, 
causing new ASMR channels to appear by the minute. ASMR carries many subcategories including loud chewing, tapping long fingernails against different objects, and cutting soaps and sands. It all strangely relaxes the mind, and trust me when I say some people would kill for it. I personally find the sound of cutting meat to be soothing. Most people I know find this to be odd and would find the entire idea of ASMR to be irksome and absurd. I spent months binge watching meat cutting videos before I found a channel called Slash and Stacy. Stacy worked as a butcher and would do all kinds of meat cuts and deboning. The squelching sounds of flesh being cut, chopped, and the cracking of pearly smooth bones set my mind free of the daily grind. I grew to anticipate her new posts and would always be one of the first to watch her new videos. Every other day, Stacy would upload new content. The footage would show a close up of a knife slicing slowly into the meat of the day on a cutting board. Once a week, she would do a live stream. She wouldn't say much beyond a greeting as we'd watch her slash away and enjoy the sound effects. All of her viewers loved her live streams the most, up until recently. As of late, her live videos would be interrupted by an old woman who would walk in and start dancing in front of the camera. This struck as odd to us all, including Stacy. She would get perturbed and cut the feed. After five minutes or so, she would always start a new stream and continue butchering as though nothing happened. Due to these interruptions, many people got fed up and began to unsubscribe. I thought it was unnecessary to blame Stacy for these rude interruptions, so I continued to support her content. It was a Friday night and I got a notification on my phone that Stacy had posted to her community post. It read, Hey Slashers! Thank you for being a huge support to my channel and allowing me to do what I love. Next week, I'm going live and it's going to be a black screen. You guessed it, this is going to be a surprise. I'll be butchering an exotic meat, and if you guys can guess correctly, I'll pick four random people to do a personal meet and greet with. Good luck, Slashers, and I'll see you on the next video. This brought excitement among her followers, and they posted on Twitter and Instagram expressing their love for Stacy. The promotion was salvaging the channel, but subscriptions weren't improving. The day of the highly anticipated live stream came, and I took an extended lunch at work so I could tune in. Hey, Slashers, can you believe it? Today's the day! You're all gonna guess what I'm slashing today. And if you guess correctly, four lucky people win a free meet and greet with me. This is a special kind of meet that's quite rare, so listen closely and comment your guesses. Good luck, Slashers! Stacy sat in front of the camera. The screen went black, and I sat at my computer zoning out to the sweet sound of creamy flesh being butchered. The comments started pouring in and everyone was throwing out every theory they could think of. I tried looking up exotic meats as I typed my input. The suggestions varied from ostrich fillets, to beef sweetbread, to wagyu, to beaver and even goat sausage. Nobody was correct and the list of exotic meats was diminishing. The viewers, including myself, were eminently baffled, and most accused her of scamming us. The number of viewers were disintegrating, and the comments shifted from guesses to people calling Stacy a scammer along with other colorful things. There was easily 1,600 people tuning in, and within minutes, I was the only viewer left. Despite what was happening, I felt pity on her. People fall on hard times, and maybe she made a desperate call. I didn't want to assume the worst. Not to mention, the sounds were especially soothing that day. Hello? Daniel? Hi, Stacy. Big fan of your content. Thank you for sticking around. I don't know what's going on with your giveaway, but I really like what you're slashing today. It's very relaxing. You want me to show you what it is? Hell yeah. Stacy zoomed out the camera so it focused on her workstation. My stomach <gasps> dropped when a human corpse with no limbs laid across the table. I watched in silent disbelief as she grabbed the arms from a bucket and began dancing around with them, <laughs> laughing maniacally. Blood was dripping all over her face and down her body as I trembled. She grabbed a saw that was used for autopsies and cut into the skull of an old woman. The same old woman from before. Stacy pulled the scalp off the woman and looked at the brain the same way one would look at a juicy steak. I couldn't divert my eyes, even though she grabbed a large spoon and scooped the brains out onto a plate. She took a fork and plunged it into the tissue. Blood splurting everywhere, she removed a large chunk and shoved it into her mouth. The horrific spell I was under was broken when I heard the voice of my coworker Steve behind me. Dude, <gasps> what the hell are you watching? I was just trying to watch some ASMR. Pretty sure ASMR is supposed to relax you. You look like you just saw a ghost. I think I need to take the rest of the day off. C can you cover for me? Yeah, man, no problem. Thanks, man. I went into the bathroom and dove into a stall, spewing my guts out. Ugh. 
The image of Stacy shoving a large bite of human brain into her mouth was burned into my head. I was left in a state of complete shock. I informed my manager that I would need to go home early that day. I drove myself home and took a shower in hopes it would get my mind on something else. I laid down on my bed and looked at my phone to find a dozen notifications from YouTube. All of them were comments from Stacy from her live feed, all addressed to me. Daniel, you left so suddenly. I didn't get a chance to tell you that the rare, exotic meat was my own grandma. Hit me up so I can do a meet and greet with you. Needless to say, I didn't meet up with her. And I know what you're thinking. Why didn't I just call the cops? Logically, that would have been the thing to do. But when you're in shock, you're not thinking clearly. I had the worst headache and I just wanted to sleep it off. I unsubscribed and blocked her from every social media platform I followed her on. A few weeks had gone by and I stopped watching ASMR altogether. I found out that Stacy had never cut the live feed and someone else tuned in. They watched as she ate her grandmother's entire brain and filleted parts of her for cooking. They called the police and she was sent to a psych ward. I felt better knowing she was in a place where she couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I thought she'd forgotten all about me. Until I got a random phone call one day. Hello? Who is this? How did you get my number? Grandma wants you to eat her too. The following story is just downright terrifying. It involves a Taco Bell employee and this random creep who you can see in this video clip, who appears to be attempting to break a Taco Bell. It's what the estranged man does after is what makes this story chilling. Here's what it looked like. I've been working at the Taco Bell in Atlanta for a few years now. I usually work the night shifts because it's slower paced due to the lack of customers around this time. However, the downfall is that you're more than likely to serve a creep, especially around this side of town. It's Taco Bell's policy that anyone is welcome to come sit inside, as long as they purchase something on our menu. I loathe the policy, as it attracts a lot of crackheads and hobos who just buy a small soda or water. Another plausible excuse to loiter as long as they want it, which literally made the workplace feel as if I was working in a homeless shelter. It wouldn't be an issue if they only sat for an hour or so. However, most of these customers tend to overstay, leaving myself and fellow co-workers to work overtime and clean up after them. The month of December had just begun. It was a snowy day when one of our creepy and erratic regulars came in and stood at the front of the counter, just staring at me. This wasn't his first rodeo with us, but tonight seemed a bit more uneasy than usual. He was easily taller than me, and his eyes were always bulged out, as though he were on something. He kept a hood over his head, so I never knew if he was bald or not. As other customers entered the Taco Bell, the creep would just stand there and let them butt ahead to order their meal. His unsettling gaze never broke, as he deeply stared into my soul. The awkward stare down then transitioned to an abrupt demand for free food. Give me some free tacos! I'm a loyal customer, so I deserve free food! Dude, I can't give you free food just because you come in every night. Give me tacos! Now! Loyal customers buy things. You don't. You need to leave. Every night for the entire month of December, this creep came in at the exact same time and would beg every staff member for free tacos, sometimes for hours. He would stare me down, approach the counter, and demand free food, like we were in debt to him or something. It was fortunate that any time I told him to leave, he did. But when it was the end of my shift, I was always terrified to walk to my car. During close, I had the responsibility of escorting all customers while I shut off the lights and locked up the restaurant. For night shift employees, we were advised to park as far away from the building. That way we could avoid any potential creeps lurking the street. Each night I walked to my car, I had this eerie feeling of being watched. I would always tuck my keys in between my fingers and speed walk as fast as possible to my vehicle. The feelings of anxiety subsided when I got into my car and left the parking lot. When I got home, I would take a shower and fall asleep to friends. 
The combination of a nice hot shower and comedy calmed me down and allowed me to face the next night. But unfortunately, any self-care remedies wouldn't stop that same creep from showing up at the Taco Bell. The exact same thing happened again. The man would awkwardly stare me down and demand free food. Give me some free food, goddammit! No! You're upsetting the other customers. Please leave. I want free food. I'm not giving you free food just because you walk in here. I don't even get free food. Make me a taco now! Get the hell out of here or I'm calling the cops! I pulled out my phone and he left. That whole night I had to deal with the anxiety of my shift ending and potentially encountering that guy again. I genuinely hated being the last one out every night and considered asking one of my co-workers to take the closing deed, but I didn't. I just mustered up any courage left in my manhood and decided to face the noise when the dreaded hour came where I would have to turn off the lights and lock up. Strangely enough, I didn't have the feeling of being watched. The night was quiet, but nothing foul lingered in the air. I kept my guard up until I got to my car and went home. I was called into work the next morning by the daytime manager. They didn't tell me what was going on until I arrived. I followed him into the office where he was reviewing security footage from the night before. He gestured for me to sit, and we reviewed the footage together. My eyes amplified in horror as I watched the very same creep that had been harassing me every night this <gasps> month crawl through the drive through window. According to the time, this was after I threatened to call the cops. My stomach dropped as I realized he'd been hiding in the restaurant while I was closing the entire time. He could have done anything to me, and thank God he didn't. As the building was deserted, he proceeded to fire up the grills and cook himself an entire meal. He ate everything he cooked and then laid down on the floor, falling asleep. We fast forwarded the footage about five hours when the man had awoken. Again, he snuck out the window but didn't leave empty handed. It was reported that he had stolen a tablet and laptop. I explained to the manager that this guy has been coming in every night this month to badger me about giving him free food and how I refused every time. The drive through window now has an automated lock on it to ensure this doesn't happen again. Despite the automated lock and the creep never showing his face again, I still felt uneasy every night. It's been a few months now and I still get quivers every time I lock up or hear someone enter the taco <gasps> This story was inspired by a news article revolving around a Starbucks female restroom. There's been many incidents revolving around creeps or peeping toms spying on females in public change rooms or restrooms. But either way, this story definitely takes the cake. What makes this more disturbing was how the individual who submitted this story included a reference photograph of the alleged occurrence. Please do keep this photograph in your mind, as it will be a key component to this story. It's tough being a working student. However, I didn't complain about it. After all, I got a job at Starbucks as a barista. With its dim lights and jazz music, the ambiance was soothing. During break time, I would bring out my laptop and do my homework while drinking coffee. However, one day I received a disturbing DM from a random guy who we will call Chris Patterson. It was a video clip of me entering a cubicle, taking down my underwear and urinating. Based on the camera's angle, I could instantly tell that it was placed underneath the toilet seat. It was disgusting. I felt violated. I sent him a DM saying, 
What the F is your problem? The perverted man replied in a casual tone, saying, I want you to be my girlfriend. It's that simple. If you don't give me what I want, I'll leak it on the internet. Nice try. Did you actually think you could blackmail me with something like that? Over my dead body. I replied, outrageously, Be careful what you wish for, Anna Smith. And that's how we ended our conversation on Instagram. Without a moment to lose, I contacted the police and filed a report against this maniac. A few hours later, I received a call from one of the officers saying that it was difficult to locate the suspect, since he was using a false name and a fake account on social media. However, they reassured me that they'd keep looking into it. When I arrived home, I received another call from an unknown source. I answered it anyway, and I heard the voice of a man chuckling on the other end. Who is this? I asked curiously, but I received no response. Instead, he <laughs> snickered incessantly. I said, who is this? The man on the other end of the phone harumphed, seemingly trying to contain his excitement. Moments later, he replied, It's me, Chris. I can't stop simping. I mean, thinking of you, baby. I sent you a little gift. A little gift? I confirmed, feeling a bit anxious. Yes! Go to your porch, Cupcake. You'll find something on the floor. He teased, clearly messing around with me. As soon as I stepped on the porch, I saw a Starbucks cup on the floor. When I picked it up, it had my name on it and my lipstick mark still on the cup. My heart throbbed fast as I searched my surroundings, feeling paranoid. Still on the phone, he aggressively said, I know you called the police, Anna. I know everything about you. You don't see me, but I, I see you. So try doing it again. I'll visit your parents' house 15 blocks away from where you live. Then I'll kill all of you. I couldn't utter a single word out of fear. Having noticed that he had my full attention, the man instructed me to be his girlfriend for a week, doing everything a boyfriend and a girlfriend should be doing together. Hence, I did as he imposed. He coerced me to meet with him at Starbucks on my day off. As I entered the coffee shop, I noticed an old scruffy looking man who seemed to be in his 40s. He had messy white hair and a demonic smile. Wearing denim pants, a black leather jacket, and a red turtleneck shirt, I was under the impression that he desperately wanted to look young and cool. He waved his hand at me, and I knew that he was Chris. He gestured for me to sit beside him, so that's what I did, even when I hesitated deep inside. He told me that he had already ordered us some drinks and asked if I wanted any pastries, but I shook my head in firm disapproval. I see. Well, you don't have to be shy, he said, drooling. My body was as stiff as a wooden plank. I couldn't help but feel uneasy being next to this creep. Then, moments later, he fondled my hand, and then eventually my lap. I jerked and asked him in a low tone to avoid drawing attention to us. What the hell do you think you're doing? What do you mean? This is what girlfriends and boyfriends do, right? He laughed as he scanned my body maliciously. Suddenly, he glanced at me with round, intimidating eyes and said, Don't forget about our little agreement, Anna. If your parents' lives aren't enough, I can also get rid of your best friends Carla and Dana and dump their bodies in a river. How did he know so much about me? How long had this pervert been stalking me? I fell silent and looked down at the table as he grabbed my hand and emphatically kissed me in public. In the following days, I was forced to stay at his place where I slept with him. Then, before going to bed, he would firmly tie up my hands and feet with metal chains to ensure that I wouldn't leave his side. Two days before the end of our deal, my parents called me on the phone to visit their house for a family reunion with my aunts, uncles, and cousins. The creep heard everything and insisted that I take him along and introduce him to the family as my boyfriend. When we arrived at my parents' house, my entire family was shocked to see that I was holding hands with an old man. Mom and dad knew my taste in men and were ultimately confused. 
However, to avoid disrespecting their new guest, my dad patted him on the back while my mom invited him to the dining area where he could enjoy a sumptuous meal. While he was busy introducing himself to my relatives, my mom gestured for me to follow her into the kitchen where she hugged me and asked, Honey, where did you get these bruises? And who really is this guy? I wanted to tell her everything. But when I glanced at Chris, who was sitting comfortably on a chair, he was staring at me with menacing eyes as he fiddled with a steak knife. Without a single word spoken, I knew he was warning me about hurting my family if I said anything to my mom. So I withdrew my initial thoughts and lied to my mom. I told her that I had an accident at work earlier that week and that Chris had nothing to do with them. While everyone was laughing in sheer bliss in the other room, I was silent intense. One week eventually passed and I was finally free. Chris kept his word, but this incident would haunt me forever. Since then, I left my job and avoided using public restrooms. Weeks later, I went to grab a coffee at the same Starbucks and saw <gasps> the same creep with another woman. Give me a kiss, Cupcake. You don't have to be so shy. The woman seemed just as tense as I was. When the man gazed at me, he gave me a wink, and I knew this was going to be a never-ending cycle. I feared for my family's life and my best friend's too, forcing me to stay silent about this incident. Until now. Technology has reached the point where sometimes even cameras are difficult to see. And police say one was hidden attached to a toilet in the bathroom of a Starbucks. Happened at the location on Outer Drive just off the Southfield Freeway. It's the size of this pen right here. Now, it's easy to hide and easy to overlook. But police say for days it was watching people inside the Starbucks. You couldn't see it, but the person on the other end of this camera definitely can see you. I've been working at Popeyes full time for a while now, and I like to think I can handle myself whenever there's pressure. I don't appreciate the type of people that quit over the day-to-day -day stress that the job naturally comes with. You should know what you're getting into when you apply to a fast food joint, and if you can't sweat it, that's on you. At least, that's how I felt up until now. Recently, there's been a customer giving me a lot of trouble. For context's sake, I'm a young black girl in my early 20s. This dude is the kind of creep that makes me not want to use my real name. So for the story, my name is Katie. But let me get on with it. This dude, I don't even know his name. I'll just call him Kevin. He's one of the morbidly obese regulars that comes in all the time, especially on Tuesdays. Tuesday is our busiest weekday because we have this Toonie Tuesday discount scheme, so all the chicken is cheaper. Kevin comes in every single Tuesday without fail and buys a whole rack of fried chicken. I can always spot his triple chin through the window before he even comes to the door. God, I hate this guy. He's always flirting with me like he's some kind of chiseled stud, but he's definitely not that. He damn near takes up two registers just standing there. I've never seen a fatter man, and he's always bragging about being a butcher, like that's some kind of attractive profession, but I do my best to handle it. I keep it professional, or whatever. All of that stuff alone, even if it were every day, wouldn't make me want to quit like I want to quit right now. It's what he did today that makes my skin crawl. He came in on a Tuesday, like always, rumbling the earth under his feet. But on this day, he wasn't empty-handed like he usually was. He was carrying what looked like some box with a blanket over it. I had no idea what it was, but I wasn't about to stare and give him something to work with. He came up to my register to order, eyeing me all up and down, starting with his usual antics. Welcome to Popeyes. What can I get you? I'll have 10 Toonie Tuesdays, baby. I mean, Katie. I didn't even bat an eye. I just kept my cool and rang him up. But of course he wasn't done yet. And please don't forget, I like my chicken dark meat only. He was getting way too close to grab that receipt. I could smell the stench of his breath as he stared at my chest, drooling like a starving dog. I didn't say anything, though. I just calmly walked back into the kitchen to help the back of the house folks prepare his ungodly large order. Obviously I didn't pay any attention to his request, because all the chicken is fried and unless you know all the cuts, it all looks the same. I got back to the counter after a minute or two and handed Kevin his 10 boxes of chicken, but I already knew he had something else to say. 
Hey, baby. Could I have a large of your best beverage? Preferably island girl flavor. Mm -hmm. Sure. That'll be two fifty nine. dollars I'll bring it out to your table in a minute. It takes a lot to not bite the head off a guy like that. But that's why they pay me 50 cents over minimum wage. There were a few other customers in line behind Kevin. And I wanted more than anything for anyone but me to bring him that drink. So I just decided to let the back of house folks pick up the ticket and fix his drink for him while I took care of other customers. But it didn't take long for things to take a turn for the worst. I guess I should have given him the kind of chicken he wanted, but screw that guy. I said dark meat only! This is ridiculous! Y'all don't know nothing about chicken! He sure got everyone's attention. A gigantic man acting like a little baby throwing a temper tantrum. Chucking boxes of chicken across the room as pieces went flying all over the store. But it's what he did with that attention that blows my whole mind. He picked up that big box he brought in and set it on the table, then tore off the blanket that covered it, revealing what it really was. A cage with a live chicken inside. He opened the trap and grabbed the chicken by the neck and lifted it in the air, waving it around so everyone could see it. The chicken squawked profusely as the man nearly choked it in the air. Then, he pulled a huge butcher knife out from God knows where. You all want to know why it's called Popeye's Chicken? Because when you cut their heads off, their eyes pop out of their little skulls. There were gasps and screams as he said this, and I saw a lot of people get up to leave. But it was too late. Kevin laid the chicken down on the counter and slammed the knife down on his neck. And sure enough, those little eyeballs popped right out of their sockets. Now, since none of you seem to get it, I'm going to show you where the dark meat is. I managed to hold back the vomit long enough to take this one opportunity to scream at the guy. Get out of here! I'm calling the cops! Don't get all flustered, baby. This is all part of your job. Now, I know I ordered a drink, so how about you bring it out to me, and then I'll leave. You like that deal? Yeah. You go get that, and I'll keep educating your customers. Shame you don't want to sit in for the lesson. You could really learn a thing or two. My blood was starting to boil. I saw that his drink never showed up on the counter, and that's when I hatched a plan. When he turned around to keep butchering the chicken, I grabbed a cup from the stack and slipped into the bathroom. I popped a squat and pissed into that cup, trying to get the job done as quickly as possible so he wouldn't notice anything. Then, I slipped back out and topped it off at 7-Up. I put on a lid and straw and hustled out to the dining area where he was now the only person left. Kevin had his back turned to me blood and feathers all over the place, and all over him. When he turned around, I nearly puked again. He was mid-bite into a piece of raw, freshly slaughtered chicken. Blood was still oozing out of the muscle, and there were still feathers in it. He didn't seem to notice. Actually, he seemed to revel in it. He threw it on the ground and snatched the drink out of my hand. He popped the lid off and chugged the whole thing right there in front of me in a matter of seconds. When he finished, he gasped for air like he'd never been so refreshed in his whole life. Then, he stared at me with knowing eyes. <sighs> that was delicious, baby. Thank you. But next time you spike my drink, make sure it's that time of the month. I'm sure you can tell I like blood. <laughs> See you next Tuesday. I've never been very successful with the ladies. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever been successful with much at all. I'm in my late 30s now, and I'm still working the same kind of construction jobs I was getting into after dropping out of high school, and I'm still unmarried and desperately single. I don't really know what it is. I think I'm an alright human as much as the next guy, and I actually make pretty decent money in my career. But maybe women see something in my face I'm not aware of that turns them off. Things just never seem to get very far with my attempts at romance. But I'll tell you, though, when things do get promising is when I get the most desperate. At least that's the case for me. My last fleeting hope went so horribly wrong in such a way that I never could have expected. Up until very recently, I've been playing the dating game with sheer numbers, knowing that my chances of connecting with any one woman are extremely slim. 
I've downloaded and scoured through just about every dating app that exists, at least the ones relevant to me, trying my odds with thousands and thousands of profiles, and every day getting a little more desperate by my lack of success. But a few weeks ago, I thought I'd finally catch a break on this website called Plenty of Fish. I matched with a rather good-looking woman who appeared to be several years younger than me, but not too young for it to be weird or anything. However, I won't disclose the name of this individual, out of fear, more than anything else. At first, I was wary of being catfished, but the profile seemed pretty realistic, as did the conversation we had over text. And really, though I know it sounds cliché, it was her personality that really drew me in, more than her looks. We texted casually for a few days, slowly getting more and more into it, texting each other increasingly often, at work, at home, at the grocery store, whenever I could get the chance. <laughs> I tell you, there's nothing like the way your heart races when you see a message pop up on your phone from someone you're interested in. I don't think my nearly 40-year-old heart could feel that way anymore, but I guess living alone for so many years will make that happen. Eventually, we decided to take things to the next level and traded numbers so we could video chat. I couldn't tell you how happy I was to finally know for sure that I wasn't being catfished. We started calling each other every day for a little while, and it started to mess with me a little bit. I guess I may have been a little obsessive because I started to use the audio recording app I use for work-related conversations to record the conversations between me and this woman. I obviously didn't tell her I did that, but other than that I feel I was pretty open and honest about myself and my feelings at the time. I hope this doesn't make you think I'm a loser or anything, but um, I work construction. Whoa, why would you be a loser for working construction? Just because you can handle yourself around the hard work that other boys would shy away from doesn't make you a loser. Whew, <laughs> I appreciate that a lot, I, I really do. You know, I I'm so glad we connected like this. To be honest, I've been missing companionship in my life for a very long time. It's very hard to come home and decompress after work when you live alone. I, I hope that doesn't make me sound desperate. Don't be afraid to share your feelings. They're all totally valid, and I'm also very happy to know you. If there's anything I can do to help you relax, just ask. You should know, I'm going to school for physiotherapy. I'm almost a professional. And I do ASMR videos on the side if you like that. Before that moment, I've never heard of ASMR, but when I asked her to explain it to me and she said she'd be softly whispering into my ears with comforting words, I was 100% on board. The very next night after work, I asked her to perform some ASMR. She agreed, telling me it would be best if I got as comfortable as possible, as though I was about to go to sleep for the night. I made sure that I was recording the conversation, as I was deeply intrigued by what might come out of this intimate whispering. Then I put in some headphones I found laying around my house, laid down, and opened up my ears to this woman. I'll admit, I was rather surprised at first. The way she'd explained it to me, I, I thought she'd be talking, but what she was actually doing was not English at all, nor any other language I could even recognize. It was all just weird gibberish that kept repeating itself in all different tones and stuff. Strange sounds she made with her mouth like someone who was very absent-mindedly beatboxing. Nonetheless, it was soothing in some way. I know it was weird, but I've never heard ASMR before, and I really didn't want to offend her, so I just accepted the weirdness of it and tried to appreciate it. Very soon, I got so relaxed that I started drifting off to sleep. I've never gotten to sleep that fast before, nor have I ever entered such a deep sleep within so little time. I was just about to think that this ASMR stuff was really working, when things started going awry. As I was floating in some sort of dream state, I began to see terrible, disturbing visions. It's hard to describe. It was like a demented light show of some demonic ritual I was being subjected to. Like all my happy thoughts were being replaced by all the horrors of the world. I tried to wake up, but I couldn't. It was like I could see my bedroom, but I couldn't move my body at all. Then, 
At the foot of my bed, a human figure appeared. A woman, but a twisted woman, like one of those demon girls from The Ring or The Grudge. She spoke, but she didn't speak any human language. She repeated the same sounds that had been made by that woman, the same sounds that had put me to sleep and left me in this state. The demon girl climbed onto my bed, then on top of me, pinning down my chest with unreal weight as she opened her rotting mouth and began making some insidious growling noise. She wrapped her broken fingers around my neck and started to squeeze. For so long, I couldn't move. Only until I was sure that I was moments away from death was I able to snap out of the trance. I jumped free of my slumber, having no idea how long I had been like that. My phone was dead and there were no lights on. I tried to stand, only to find that my head was both spinning and throbbing in pain, like I was drunk, like I downed a whole bottle of whiskey and then smashed it over my head. I spent several minutes just catching my breath and regaining my balance, trying to wrap my mind around what had just happened. Eventually, I decided to play back the recording I'd made. I plugged in my phone and booted it back up. The audio file was right there, and hours long. I pressed play and listened in cautiously, just the same unsettling gibberish as before, repeating itself for hours. I had no idea how anyone could keep up such repetition for so long, but it didn't explain what had happened. I began to theorize that I had been psychologically infiltrated by some subliminal messaging, so I plugged my phone into my computer and uploaded the file into an audio editing software. The first thing I did was reverse it, like they used to do with controversial records back in the day. I was floored immediately. Somehow, what was nothing but meaningless mouth sounds before came to form words when played in reverse. I warn you that listening to this audio could potentially cause you to have an episode like the one I had, but I offer up this clip for those who are curious. And if you're wondering, I can't find the woman anymore. She blocked me. And I think maybe she was never real in the first place. His love is grand. His love is pure. But one thing's for sure, his love for the devil will outweigh any love he possesses in this world. I've since never dabbled in any dating apps and always cringe every time I see an ASMR mukbang video pop up in my recommended page. Hello there! Back with another mukbang video. Anyway, who wants to see me devour all this good good in a blink of an eye? <laughs> this story was inspired by a case that occurred in a home at Hucknall, Nottinghamshire. This was a house party gone bad, as tempers flared up between a couple that resulted in a fatal tragedy. When you combine alcohol, females, and of course a hot tub, you are bound to have a good time. But in this case, it was all but that. Here's what it looked like. One day, my office maid, Sophia, invited me to her house party that would transpire on a Friday evening. She lived with her boyfriend in a typical American wooden home about 2,300 square feet. On her Instagram account, they seemed to be a lovely couple. On the night of the event, I came to her house wearing shorts and a sparkling top. There were tons of people there, so I had to squeeze myself in. While I finally made it through the thick crowd, I saw Sophia filling a glass of beer at the food table. I snuck up behind her, startling her in the process. Whoa, someone's a bit edgy tonight. I said, patting her on the back. A bit. She replied, a little self-conscious. This is the first time I'm hosting a party. This is all James' idea, you see? No wonder. I said while mixing myself a margarita. By the way, when can I meet him? Scratching her head, she replied in a lackadaisical manner. Well, you can meet him anytime. If you can find him amidst this crowd, that is. Something seemed to be bothering Sophia. I felt it in my gut, but I was reluctant to ask her because it didn't seem like the proper time. This was a party, and we had to make the most of it. Hence, I pulled Sophia to the dance floor, attempting to uplift her spirits. 
For a moment, we were actually having fun, as she laughed every now and then. However, something seemed to have caught her eye as she gazed at the second floor window. I couldn't see what she was looking at, but she immediately left me without a word. Hey, wait up! What's the matter? I asked, feeling concerned. She turned to me with anxiety in her tone and said, I'm just a little exhausted, that's all. I'll get some medication from my room upstairs, then come back down. So go ahead and enjoy the party. Okay, if you say so. I replied apprehensively, allowing her to scurry into the house. Then, moments later, I followed her in. I made my way up the stairs as silently as I could. As I set foot on the second floor, I found a door that was slightly open and saw that the room was empty. I went inside and hid in the closet when I heard footsteps fast approaching. Moments later, I saw Sophia enter the room, yanking a man who might have been James. What the hell were you thinking smooching another woman like that? And in my house? Sophia berated. Your house? This is my house too, you know? He said with a series of hiccups. And since this is my house, I can do whatever I want. He turned away and went for the balcony door. What is your problem? I covered my mouth to keep from gasping out loud at the scene. They've always seemed like such a happy couple. As soon as he left, I exited the closet. I tried to console her. She stood up gingerly and replied, It's nothing. I told you to just go back to the party, didn't I? This is none of your business. As she turned her back on me, I replied, Where are you going? She glared at me and said, I'm going to bed. Then, she left the room, slamming the door behind her. Instead of going back downstairs, I went to the balcony to blend in with the other guests who were drinking and chatting. There, I saw James mingling with a couple of party girls. They held their drinks as they danced in a flirtatious manner. Moments later, two of the girls in a bikini who jumped into the hot tub gestured for him to join them and two other guys. James was delighted and immensely drunk. All right, ladies! I've been waiting to do this all night, and now I'm finally doing it! James started to remove his boxers while the women in the hot tub were cheering for him, repeatedly saying, Take, take it, it off! Take, take it, it off! It take it, it off! Take it off! James, stop! You're not seriously thinking about skinny dipping in the tub with those girls, are you? Sophia bellowed as she peeked from the bedroom window. Seeing that James wasn't paying attention to her, she climbed out the window, stepped on the balcony floor, and said, Don't you dare, James! James continued to ignore her and skinny dipped in the tub. His other companions laughed as they playfully invited Sophia to join them. Disgusted, she left the balcony and went back inside the house. Moments later, all the lights and music went out, including the power to the hot tub. The crowd was confused and a few girls screamed. Ah, just when it was starting to get lively out here, James hollered aloud as the drunken girls giggled. Don't worry, ladies. Sophia must have flicked the master switch on the fuse box. I got this. Don't go anywhere. I'll be back, okay? The girls tittered once more as James left the tub and went inside the house, still naked. Convinced that I finally had enough of this party, I decided to go back downstairs and head back home. Unfortunately, it seemed like some of the other guests inside the house were thinking of doing the same thing, as a few dozen of them started leaving the party. I thought of using the restroom first before leaving, but before doing so, I noticed that another door next to it was open. For a moment, it seemed as though I had heard someone scream. So, I used my cell phone flashlight and went down to the basement, where James or someone else could have gotten into an accident. Reaching the basement floor, my flashlight caught trickles of blood. I followed the trail and said, Hello? Does anyone need help? What I saw next took me by surprise. Arriving at the corner where the fuse box was, I saw a pool of blood and James's lifeless body on the pavement. Sophia was constantly stabbing him with a kitchen knife, ripping out his guts. Her eyes were round and ominous, and her grin was sinister. As she gradually stood to her feet, I made a run for it up the stairs and hollered, Someone help! Please! Sophia stabbed James! Help! Sophia stabbed James! Sophia stabbed James! Help! 
As I made it up the stairs, I noticed basically everyone had already left and gone home. With my trembling hands, I called the police. They arrived quickly and Sophia was arrested. However, I will never forget the contempt and hatred in her eyes. Since that frightful night, I haven't been to other house parties. You should just give up, Miss Mellons. You're not gonna win this war, so get used to seeing this six pack of flap every day. Better leave. I've been the head barista at my local Starbucks for several years now. It's an exceptionally busy location, owing to its proximity to the major university that makes up the majority of the city's population. Lots of students and professors use the interior of the Starbucks as a place to get hopped up in caffeine and grind out whatever work it is they have to do. Because of that, I'm quite used to seeing some of the same regulars come in either every day or every other day. Sometimes to stay for a while and sometimes just stopping in for their fix and then going on about their business elsewhere. I used to be one of those people, working on my degree on my laptop and getting addicted to caffeine in the process. But when I graduated, I found out my degree wasn't worth the paper it was printed on which got me stuck working the evening shift full-time at one of the 10,000 Starbucks in the nation. It's not the way I wanted my life to go, but it's the only option I had. I had to support my mother. She'd been raising me on her own for most of my life. My father had walked out on us so long ago that I couldn't even remember what he looked like. But during that time I spent at work, I wasn't thinking about any of that sob story stuff. I made do with a little bit of self-loathing for picking the wrong degree which I made up for by maniacally laughing to myself about how the majority of college students I serve were making the same mistake I did. That's how I managed to handle all their disrespectful attitudes and cringeworthy entitlement. Of course, there was one customer who was different from the rest. It seemed like he was just out to get me for some reason. He was an older, fatter fellow. He wore a suit every day as if he were trying to be classy or professional. But the condition of his clothing and of his whole body in general made him seem like he had been quite unsuccessful in life. Everything about him was tattered, withered, worn out. He didn't fit in with the coffee shop crowd. He was too old to be a student, but also too unkempt and downtrodden to be a professor. Despite this, within a week of his first visit to the location, he identified himself as a regular, just because of his downright unhealthy addiction to caffeine. Unfortunately, his dependence on coffee was the only typical thing about him. He always came during the hours that I was holding down the front counter, and every day his order was the same. Black coffee, hot, and the largest size you have. Would you like any room for cream or sugar? No, no, I said black. More room for coffee. Not only would he refuse to say any of the Starbucks brand sizes, which honestly I respect, but he would also stare at me very intensely the whole time. Lots of people will watch me while I make their coffee. But mostly those people are the Karens in training who order super complicated drinks and love to be nitpicky and nasty. Pouring a cup of black coffee is literally the easiest thing I can do all day. Yet this man would watch me like a hawk as I did it. And here's your coffee, sir. Expertly done, young man. Thank you. But the stares wouldn't end there. After getting his coffee, he'd waddle over to a table in a far corner, then pull a flyer out of his briefcase and begin to read it. At first, this didn't seem unusual to me. Reading is a common thing to do in a coffee shop, but it didn't take me long to realize what was amiss about his particular choice of reading material. When I say flyer, I mean like a flyer you get in the mail. I'm pretty sure it was a furniture catalog or something. Whatever it was, it certainly couldn't have actually entertained anyone for more than five minutes. Despite that, this guy would read the flyer like it was a whole novel. I started to get suspicious after just a couple hours. I initially thought he might be some older creep coming into a college town to try and find some younger girls to prey on, which raised my guard. I'm basically the evening manager at Starbucks, so I felt it was my responsibility to make sure he didn't hurt anyone. But again, it didn't take long for me to realize there was something off about that picture. I would steal away many glances in his direction, and not once did I catch him looking at anyone else but me. I would be able to feel his eyes on me the whole time I was busy, and when I finally got a chance to look over at him, he'd just flip up the corner of the flyer to cover his eyes like it was a newspaper or something. And I also have to mention just how much coffee this man drank. I never once saw him with a cup of water, but he would come up to me at least once every single hour of my shift and ask for a refill of his coffee. Now don't get me wrong, one or two, maybe even just three cups of coffee is normal enough. But six, seven, even eight cups of coffee in a single day? That's just a problem. This all went on for a couple weeks. I never really had a reason to justify kicking him out, though I certainly wanted to. That was the case until he started trying to follow me home. He got in the habit of staying in the shop until close. And when I told him he had to leave, 
he would walk outside rather begrudgingly, then just stand right in front of the door. He didn't harass any of my coworkers, but when I tried to leave, boy did all that caffeine come out to play. One night I got fed up and snapped at him. We're getting pretty close now, don't you think? Why don't we hang out? You sure make a mean cup of coffee. We could stay up all night and chat, you know? What if I hired you to make coffee at my place? Or I'll pay you for coffee at your place. You wouldn't mind if I came over, would you? Get away from me, man! I don't know you! Just go to the dive bars like the rest of the people your age and leave me alone! After that night I yelled at him. Things got a little sketchier. The next day, he was different. He was no longer even bothering to fake read that stupid flyer. He was just staring me down unimpeded. Even my co-workers started to get freaked out by him. What was also concerning was that he had stopped drinking coffee and switched to straight espresso. In that one day, he probably had 20 shots of the stuff, which is just an inhuman amount of caffeine to consume. Just thinking about it made me a little sick. But on this day, the man had a question he wanted to ask me every time he came up to order another double shot. And every time, the question was the same. Roger. That's your name, is it? Your name tag says so. What about your last name? My last name has nothing to do with coffee, sir. Forget about it. Oh, don't be like that, man. I'm just curious. Just tell me what's your last name. I lost track of how many times he asked me. Every time I talked to him, he got a little more unhinged and hyperactive. He started talking faster and louder, and I began to see the blood vessels in his neck and face bulge with unhealthy pressure. His eyes turned bloodshot and began to overdilate. Oh, come on, man. It's just a name. It doesn't mean anything. Just tell me your last name. Fine! I'll tell you if you just shut up! My last name's Walker! Happy? Well, isn't that funny? That's... that's my last name. <laughs> he collapsed to the floor very suddenly, in the middle of speaking, never finishing his sentence because his mouth was spasming and full of foam, and then the heart attack took him. It seemed pretty obvious that the caffeine overdose had contributed to it, but that alone wasn't it. I called an ambulance and they came and identified the man as Jonathan Walker. My heart sunk all the way down to my stomach. I have very fleeting memories of my father from childhood, however he abandoned my mom and I 15 years ago. He was estranged for longer than I could remember, and though he looked very different all those years later, I knew in my heart that this guy was him. He tried to reconnect with me in his own strange and maladjusted way, and I hadn't noticed until it was too late. I knew that amount of caffeine was enough to give someone a heart attack, but up until I realized he was my father, I hadn't cared about his well-being. I'd go back and change it if I could. But what's done is done. The next story was inspired by some camera footage regarding a Taco Bell clown terrorizing various fast food locations. This was in fact a true story, so you could only imagine how the employees felt. Here's what the story looked like. My mom always warned me not to work at fast food or convenience stores, and to especially avoid working night shifts. She always said I would never know what kind of crazy people I would run into, but I never really understood why. When the time came for me to get my first job, I was just interested in landing what was available for a sheltered space cadet like myself, so I ended up working the late shift at Taco Bell as a drive through attendant. For a while, I thought my mom was just a little paranoid. Yeah, the people who came to the drive-thru at 1.30 in the morning were a little strange and usually intoxicated, but I never had to be in the same room with them. And even then, business was usually so slow I spent most of my time cleaning. Honestly, I spent so many hours doing so little that I was wishing for something interesting to happen. But, like they say, be careful what you wish for. There was one night that stands out among the rest. As my memory of working at Taco Bell continues to fade into a blur, this one night only gets clearer and clearer. It started off just as mundane as any other night, slow and quiet, just me and a cook. I hadn't had a customer come through the lane in almost 20 minutes, and closing time was drawing near. That's when the car pulled up to the intercom. Hi, welcome to Taco Bell. How may I take your order? Yeah, uh, let me get all... Shh, bro, hold up. What, man? Sorry, man, I thought I saw a cop car drive by and I got spooked. Well, chill the hell out, man. I'm just ordering right now. Just let me know when you're ready to order. It sounded like two people were in the car arguing over what to get. That sort of thing happens all the time. People get up to order and haven't even looked at the menu, so they have to figure it out on the spot. After a few seconds, they spoke again. All right, man, we're ready. Uh, just a chicken chipotle melt. All right, sir. Anything else? Nah, man, that's it. Thank you very much. All right, sir. That'll be $1.09. Please pull up to the window. I was really only halfway aware of anything that was going on, such as the nature of the late night shift. 
But I was a little confused. It was strange to me that two dudes in a car would only get one item and have it be the cheapest thing on the menu. But I figured maybe the other guy just decided he didn't want anything. Within a couple seconds, the car had pulled up to the window. The car's windows were super tinted, so I couldn't see inside until they rolled their window down. In the driver's seat was a man with his hood up, and for some reason, sunglasses on at night. I could barely see any of his face, but what was weirder was the fact that there was nobody in the passenger seat. For a moment, I was dumbfounded. I was sure that there had been two people talking to each other in the car, but then I saw the man in the driver's seat reach his hand out in a fist, as if he was about to pay with a bunch of quarters. Out of habit, I opened the drive through window. That's when the barrel of a gun appeared from the side and pointed straight into my eyes. I froze. He'd been just outside the window, around the corner, waiting for me to open it. His face was concealed by a mask, but it was no less menacing. It was one of those creepy killer clown masks, and I was absolutely terrified of clowns. He grabbed me by the collar and pulled me halfway out the window, keeping the barrel of the gun right in front of my eyes. You try anything and you're dead! He pushed me back with a great deal of force, sending me reeling into the kitchen. Overcome with fright, I fell to the floor. As I watched the robber climbing through the window, I realized he was wearing a varsity jacket. What's more, the jacket was from my high school. This guy was my classmate and probably the same age as me. He threw a pillowcase at me and started barking orders while still holding me at gunpoint. Get up, punk! Come on! Get up! Pick up that bag! Get over here and open the register! Do it! I tried to obey the orders as quickly and calmly as I could, but I was absolutely racked with fear. My hands were shaking and I felt like I could barely breathe. Unfortunately, this only agitated him. Hurry up! All the money in the bag! All of it! Let them tray! I know where you hide it, so don't try and trick me! You try anything and you're dead! Here, man, that's all of it. This is jump change! You ain't done yet, punk! Get up front and open those registers! Those registers are empty until the open shift. You're lying to me! Open them up, now! I obeyed again. I pushed no sale and showed him the empty drawers. He flipped out. This is bull! You better show me some money, you're gonna get it, man! Empty the safe! I can't, man, I'm sorry. Only the manager can open and they're not here overnight, I promise! You better not be lying to me! Swear on your mother! I swear, man, I swear on my life! My heart was pounding. The madder the robber got, the more I worried that I might lose my life. But I got a moment to breathe when he ran into the kitchen and dragged the cook out from hiding, putting us together and holding both of us at gunpoint. Turn out your pockets! I want everything you got! Phone, wallet, chains! What's yours is mine! The cook and I handed over everything and dropped it in the pillowcase. He looked almost as frightened as me. We just wanted to make it out alive. Thankfully, it seemed like it was coming to a close. Come on, man! Wrap it up! We're out of time! Alright, man, I'm done! Go, go, go! I've never felt so relieved in my life. For a long, surreal moment, the cook and I sat in silence. I knew I'd be having nightmares for the rest of my life. When we gathered ourselves together, the cook picked up the restaurant phone and called the police. They ended up catching those kids within hours, because he wore that stupid varsity jacket. Both of those kids were only 17, and when their names came out, I realized I'd heard them in roll call before. But the harshest realization was that the gun I'd been petrified by wasn't even a real gun, just a replica. Still, they robbed two other places that night, and it didn't make a difference. While we were waiting for the police to arrive, a customer pulled up to the window, which was still wide open, and started catching an attitude, totally unaware of what had just happened. We're closed! Watch as a teenager dressed in a clown mask robs this Domino's pizza worker using what looks like a gun. This is surveillance video from inside the fast food shop in Phoenix, Arizona. Cops say two 17-year-old suspects have been arrested in connection with the crime here and in a similar incident at a Taco Bell within an hour of each other. Police say the teen hiding behind the mask, whose name was not released, was charged with three armed robberies. The other teen, they say, acted as the getaway driver. Give me some free tacos. I'm a loyal customer, so I deserve free food. Dude, I... The next story was inspired by a notorious case revolving around a man named Tim. Most of you have heard of this individual, but for those who haven't, here's an animation inspired by the events revolving around him. Four years have passed since I married my first wife, Emma, a kind and beautiful woman. 
After getting married, we lived in Greensboro, where she aided me in running the ice cream shop and miniature golf course as my accountant. One day, I called the ambulance to report a drowning incident. When they arrived at the house and asked what had happened to my wife, I told them she was a heavy drinker. We were both having a good time in our hot tub. I asked her to stop drinking, however, she persuaded me to just have one more bottle. Then I went to the restroom inside the house to answer the call of nature. When I got back out to the backyard, she had dropped the bottle, and I found her lifeless body submerged in the tub. Emma! No! No, 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 no! As I grieved for her over time, I met Lilibeth along the way, who was generous enough to lend me a bit of spare time whenever I needed someone to talk to. Eventually, I had to move on, and now I'm happily married to my second wife, Lilibeth. One day, Lily and I were enjoying ourselves in the hot tub. I didn't want the death of my first wife to discourage myself or Lily from getting in one. I had finally gotten closure as time went on. But one night, my wife began pulling my arm with an anxious look. At first, I thought that she was feeling unwell, so I asked her, What's the matter, dear? I, I think someone's watching us through the fence. She said, her eyes restless. Concerned about my wife's well-being, I left the tub and put on my bathrobe to check on the fence. When I came closer, I found a small hole that made it possible for someone to take a peek. My neighbor's house was on the other side of the fence, where an old man lived by himself. My wife and I didn't have the chance to interact with him because he often secluded himself. I decided to cover the hole with a short wooden plank that I had in the garage. The following day, I walked along the sidewalk when the old man caught me off guard and said, How was the hot tub? Defensive over the way he invaded our privacy, I cussed him and said, Mind your own business, you old geezer. Outraged, he replied, You better watch your back, son, you hear me? Peeved and bewildered, I asked, Excuse me? Did you just threaten me? He glared at me without saying anything before heading back inside the house. I didn't want to alarm my beloved wife, so I decided to keep it to myself. Late in the afternoon, my wife and I dipped into the hot tub, gazing at the sky as the sun set. But for some reason, I was perturbed. It seemed like I saw my neighbor using binoculars, looking in our direction. When I rose from the tub to have a closer look, I saw him step away from the second floor window turning off the lights in his room. My wife, somewhat agitated, asked me, What is it, dear? Why are you looking at our neighbor's house? After making sure he was no longer peering through the windows, I gradually returned to my wife in the tub and replied, It's nothing. Don't worry about it. The next day, I intentionally dropped by my neighbor's house after work. I needed to let him know the discomfort he was causing my wife and I. Stepping out into the veranda, the old geezer held a butcher knife in one hand, staring at me with eyes ablaze. What do you want, son? The old man asked apprehensively. And what do you plan to do with that knife? I replied, straining my words. He chortled, then said, What I do with my knife is none of your business, boy. There are other things you should be worrying about. Before things got out of hand, I warned him. If you ever interfere with my wife and I or lay a single finger on her, I will not hesitate to call the police. You got that, you old man? I stepped back slowly as I watched him walk away without saying another word. Get the hell off my property or I am calling the cops! That night, I decided to go into the hot tub with my wife telling her that I had finally confronted the old man. My wife seemed trepidatious at first, but was soon relieved when I reassured her that nothing was to worry about. Then, my wife playfully invited me to a little game to which she said, Stop paying attention to the old geezer and pay attention to me. Want to see who can hold their breath the longest underwater? Although I felt a little uneasy seeing how Emma had passed, I didn't want to spoil the mood. So I asked, <laughs> Sounds like fun. What brought this up all of a sudden? Lilibeth chuckled, <laughs> batting her eyelashes flirtatiously. Well, we've been under a lot of stress lately, and I just wanted to alleviate all that. I told myself. 
I furtively glanced at my neighbor's window and noticed that all the lights were out. Finally, my wife and I were left alone in peace. I offered to go first. All right, here goes. I curled up into a coil and submerged my entire body. Underwater, I could hear Lilibeth's muffled voice counting. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Until she eventually reached the number 10. Then I raised my hand to signal that I was already out of breath. As soon as my head resurfaced, Lilibeth said with a wink. I'm sure I can do better than that. I raised an eyebrow, grinned, and said, I'm sure you can, dear. I have a deal. If you manage to go past 10, I'll buy you your favorite orchids. She nodded in delight. As soon as she submerged, I counted. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, until I reached eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, nine Mississippi, nine Mississippi. I just kept repeating the number nine until she signaled me to stop so she could gasp for air. But then I told her, we're not at number 10 yet. You still want those orchids, don't you? The splashing continued for a few more seconds until she no longer moved. Moments later, as I clothed myself in a bathrobe, someone rang the doorbell. When I asked who it was, he identified himself as the police. Upon opening the door, five cops stormed the house and arrested me after finding Lilibeth's floating body. <sighs> Later on, I was convicted of first-degree murder, even when I said that my late wife drowned due to excessive alcohol intake. On the witness stand was my neighbor, the old man who said he recognized me as the person who killed my first wife, Emma, by strangling her in the tub. Later on, an autopsy examination was presented in court, proving that I killed Lilibeth. Give me some free tacos! I'm a loyal customer, so I deserve free food! Dude, I can't give you free food just because you come in every night. Give me tacos, now! Loyal customers buy things, you don't. You need to leave. 